here's what's going to happen tonight. Um, I'm going to interview the two of these beautiful people, and I'm going to start with some questions about the two of them as a couple, because the truth is that we, we make people into caricatures, and really, they are real people, real people, and really cool people. <laughs> they happen to be. Um, so we're going to talk to them a little bit as a couple, and then we're going to find out all the things that are on his mind and on his heart, and then we'll open it up to questions. How does that sound? That's good. Okay, so most important question, how did you guys meet? I, I happen to be on the inside of this, but it's the funniest, cutest thing. Who, who maybe was part of introducing you? Oh, he doesn't, I'm sure he doesn't want us to so be- So don't say, but okay. how did you guys meet? Where were you? Where were you that you met? We were in, in Banff. Yeah, Canada. In Canada, and I had, uh, I had been living with Larry for David. two. David. Yeah. David. <laughs> You've been living with Larry. Yeah, during the summer times for a couple of years. What's it like to live with Larry, Dave? No, it's very, it's very smooth. Yeah, entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, and that was when he was just finishing Seinfeld. And then he went. He started working on uh, on Curb. And um, the first time I met Cheryl was when uh, he brought her to a ski event. We had our big fundraiser, Waterkeeper Lives. I was running a big environmental group. It was the biggest water protection group in the world. Um, and we raised our money through a pro celebrity ski race every year. We moved around, but most, we were doing a lot of them in Banff. And it was always all the celebrities back out at the last minute, and so then you have to scramble and get new ones in. By Cheryl. It's not a very nice way to. I was so desperate. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Cheryl came uh, the first one. I don't. I think were you married already then? Yes, I was married. <laughs> Well, they were friends for a while. Before yeah, yeah. Dated. Yeah, I think for seven years. Yes. Yeah. Like acquaintances. I would I would see you once a year at, the, at a waterkeeper event. Yeah. But you were pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> and then who was into who first? Well, then when we did, when both of us were getting, uh, we had both filed divorce at the same time. And that's when the... Uh, the crisis happened at that at the Waterkeeper event that year, and a whole lot of celebrities dropped out at the last minute. And, and my assistant said we should get Cheryl to come up. I don't know why I like the go-to. Uh, well, yeah, because, everybody, nobody else can make it, have, so let's get Heinz. You had, you had a birthday party. Or you had some, I, was, I was having a Christmas party, and I said, "Oh, I can't do it because I just invited people over." Yeah. And then I talked her into it. And I then, had to tell everybody not to come over. I was mm -hmm. like, I guess I'm going to go to this event. Go ahead. Yeah, and that, and I think um, there was. We sat next to each other at dinner that night, and there was, and there was instant chemistry. I would say. Yeah. And then, um, but then I thought felt like Larry has all these rules that uh -oh. people are supposed to know. Um, <laughs> And that, that aren't written down anywhere, but everybody knows them. And I knew it would be a rule that I could not date his television wife. <laughs> but I, I, you know, <laughs> so you asked him? I went to the Carlisle Hotel yeah. at around 11 o'clock at night. I called him and told him I had to, he was shooting that year. They were shooting Curb in, in New York. In New York. And I went up to the Carlisle Hotel, and I, I was worried that he would say no, and then I'd have to make a decision between him and her. But he, Friend uh, or wife? <laughs> but he, um, he said, uh, uh, he, he really surprised me because he said that that's wonderful, and he said, um, she's the best human being that I've ever met. And he said, she is absolutely beloved in this industry. She's the only person that I know of in this industry that doesn't have a single enemy. And he said, I'm really happy for you, but that's not what he said to her. 
No, he said it'll never work. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, but but I I you know he was kidding, not kidding, because I was saying it wouldn't matter who I said I was gonna date. Right. That would have been the response, whether yeah. it was Bobby or you know, I would just said George Clooney, and then, and that's. <laughs> A lot of the things that I did, a lot of things that happened in my relationship with Larry ended up on the show. And that incident ended up on the show with Ted Danson coming to Larry and asking right. him for permission to, uh, to date Cheryl. And I think he just said, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> so I know that's what he was secretly thinking. He was talking to me. <laughs> okay, so Cheryl. Yes? I don't know if everybody knows that you grew up in a small town called Tallahassee, Florida. Yeah. I went to college. Go Knowles. Thank you, Emily Fletcher. Oh, no. oh we got you. <laughs> and um, did you ever in your wildest dreams think that one day you'd be sitting in the seat, potentially, like, did you ever think this is a potential that you would be married to somebody who's going to be the president of the United States? No. No, this is uh, this is um, beyond my imagination. You know, I grew up. Um, she couldn't think of that a, a year ago. No, yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'm I'm shocked. <laughs> but you know, I grew up in a in Tallahassee, and my mom. Um, we were not a political family, and I remember asking my mom who she voted for, and she said. That is none of your business, and that is a secret. <laughs> I was like, oh, politics, that's are weird. I didn't know there were secrets about who you vote for. So that was my upbringing. Was not, it was not a politically um, inspired environment. Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been in the acting realm, so I never, ever... <laughs> thought I would be sitting next to my husband who's running for president. So this is a something I'm sharing my, with all of you. This is a surprise, an exciting surprise. It's amazing. It's so amazing to have real human beings, like literally like the girl next door and people you feel who see you, who get you, right? Who can be ambassadors for you. And so... I feel like it's it's one thing where people talk about what's going wrong. People love to talk about what's going wrong. And we're, we'll talk about that in a second. But I think what great leaders do is they have such clear vision that everybody else can see their vision because you see it so clearly. And so I'd love you to have a moment to like share with us what you think it could look like. What could this country look like the way you see it? Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm running because I feel like the country went off on a, uh, got derailed on the wrong track, and um, we forgot who we were. You now I grew up that, thinking that this country was an exemplary nation, that we were the city on the hill, that we were, and you know, when I was a kid, America was admired uh, universally around the globe. And we were not only admired, but we were regarded as a moral authority. Yeah. And um, and everybody, you know, people wanted our leadership. Um, they they wanted our leadership. They didn't want bullying, and they knew the difference. And I told this story the other day that my my uncle um, had an abhorrence for war. My uncle John Kennedy had he once was asked by his one of his two best friends, Ben Bradley, who was the publisher of the Washington Post, what do you want on your gravestone? And he said to them, uh, and he said to Bradley, uh, he immediately, without even thinking about it, he kept the peace. Um, he had been, you know, I, I, he had fought in World War II. He had seen the bloodshed. He had a lot of friends killed. His boat ship had gotten sink. He was declared uh, killed in action for a while until, you know, he was found on this uh, island in the Solomon Islands. He and his crew, and his father hated war, and protested World War I. Uh, and he said that the principal job, he told Bradley, the principal job of the President of the United States is to keep the country out of war. And he was surrounded by 
uh, people and intelligence apparatus and by Joint Chiefs of Staff who felt the opposite and who felt like war was inevitable, particularly with the Soviet Union, and the sooner they came, the better. And he found out after he, after he was two months in office, he was lied to by the three top officers of the CIA, by Alan Dulles, by Charles Cabell, and by uh, Richard Bissell about the Bay of Pigs. And he did not want to invade Cuba. He, at that time, there were no Soviet troops in Cuba, and he felt like the United States was going to look like a bully around the world if it invaded this island that had made its own choice about a, a, a system that we didn't like, but we really had no business interfering with it. And he didn't, he, he didn't want the U.S. to have anything to do with it. The, the plan of the Bay of Pigs was to use naval amphib amphib amphibious vehicles from the U.S. Navy to transport the, the Cuban Brigade, which was 2,200 men, I think 2,200, uh, over to the Bay of Pigs. My uncle said, no, we're not going to have the U.S. military can't have anything to do with this. They ended up using uh, ships from United Fruit Company, which owned all the sugar cane in Cuba. And, and uh, that Alan Dulles had represented when he was in his previous job as a lawyer for Sullivan Cromwell. My uncle didn't want to have, have anything to do with it. And he, he said to Dulles, how can 2,200 men conquer Cuba? because Castro has 200,000 troops, very well trained and very disciplined. And he would, you know, Castro was a warrior. He'd been fighting for years and he knew how to run an army. And, uh, and Dulles and uh, Louis Lemonser, the head of the Joint Chiefs, sat in his office and said, because we've done intelligence and Castro is enormously unpopular in Cuba, which was a lie, that as soon as the troops of the brigade lands, the Cuban people will rise up and overthrow them. And he said, because we are not. He knew they wanted him to bring in the Essex, which was the U.S. aircraft carrier, and actually run the invasion. And he told him, we are not using U.S. military in any part of this operation. And when those men landed on the beach and they were being killed and captured, he confronted all us, he confronted Louis Lemonser, and then he came out of that, and they said, you need to send in air cover, and we need to get the U.S. military involved. And he came out of that meeting, and he said, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. That was two months into his, his presidency, three days before his inauguration, which I attended. I was six years old at that time. Uh, Eisenhower who was outgoing, it gave probably what was probably the most important speech in United States history, where he warned the American people against the rise of a, um, of a military industrial complex and a scientific technocracy that would subvert American democracy, that would overwhelm and devour all of the, uh, the, the critical fundamental values of our nation. And uh, and my uncle, at that moment when he walked out of that, uh, at that meeting with his, you know, these top military aides, understood that that's what was happening to him. And he spent the next thousand days of his presidency fighting, pushing back with his military advisors, his intelligence apparatus who wanted to bring the country to war. They wanted, he kept us out of Laos. He kept us out of Vietnam. He did not send any. He sent 16,000 advisors. They wanted 250,000 ground troops. He sent 16,000 advisors. And uh, and they were, that's fewer people than he sent to the University of Mississippi to Jackson to get uh, James Meredith, a one black man, into you know the university. So he sent Green Berets over there who were not allowed to participate in in combat by the rules of engagement. Some of them did anyway. 75 of them were killed over that uh, three-year period. And when he found that out in October of 1963, that 75 Americans had, had died in Vietnam, he said, we're not going to lose one more man. And he signed a national security order ordering all troops out of Vietnam. So he spent his presidency not putting any combat troops anywhere in the world. And as soon as he was killed, uh, Johnson remanded that order. And then a year later, the Tonkin Gulf resolution occurred. And we sent 250,000 men, which they all wanted, 
and I, and it became America's war. And 56,000 Americans did not come back, including my cousin George Skakel, who died during the Tet Offensive. And um, my father ran against that war in 68 and was killed in the process. And Nixon then, you know, sent 500,000 troops over there. And since then, we've had a series of traumas in this country. The death of Martin Luther King, who was campaigning, who had, you know, who had displaced the civil rights battle as a peace emissary against Vietnam. My father killed two months later. Um, the Vietnam War that then followed uh, up until 73 and, and you know, the, the uh, uh, the 9-11 attacks and ultimately COVID. And each of that, those traumas has pushed us further and further down the path that Eisenhower predicted, which is the you know domination of this country, that our country would become an imperium abroad and a national security state at home. And that's what the founders of our country had predicted. They said, you get America, John Quincy Adams said, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Um, I, uh, Paul Kennedy is a, who's one of the, you know, a Yale historian and has studied the decline of empires. And he did this wonderful book about the rise and decline of empires. For 500 years, he looks at every empire and every one of them has been destroyed by, uh, for the same reason, overextending its military abroad. And, you know, we've now are doing the exact same thing, which Eisenhower predicted. We have become a, a security state at home, a garrison state, a surveillance state at home, uh, and we become a you know an imperium abroad, and with, that is constantly you know the, the fun, my uncle understood that the function of the CIA was to was to to provide the military industrial complex with a constant pipeline of new wars, uh, and that you know to me that's kind of the, was the was the fork in the road and you know that everybody predicted this is where we'd end up and in the last two years you know we saw the whole thing culminate in COVID which um with all of our constitutional rights being subverted you know our, our right free speech for the first time in history the government was involved in you know in silencing people including me specifically but more importantly doctors and scientists who were who were questioning the, you know, the government approach. And, um, you know, and the government approach which should have been questioned. We, you know, the things that they decided, you know, the lockdowns, et cetera, didn't work. We ended up having uh, the worst death count of any country in the world. We have 4.2% of the global population. We had 16% of the COVID deaths. So we did worse than any nation in the world. And then at the same time, they you know they got rid of jury trials on the, the Seventh Amendment. They got rid of freedom of religion. They closed every church in this country for a year without scientific citation, with no democratic process, no notice and comment rulemaking, no environmental impact statement. They got rid of the right to assembly by telling us we had to social distance. Uh, they got rid of property rights. They closed down 3.3 million businesses. Uh, without due process, without just compensation. They got rid of the Fourth Amendment, uh, prohibitions against warrantless searches and seizures, with all this track and trace surveillance and us having to produce our medical records to leave our home or whatever. And, you know, a lot of people can say, well, it was a crisis. Um, but there is no pandemic exception in the United States Constitution. And the founders, the framers, knew all about pandemics. There were two epidemics during the revolution. One, a, a, a malaria epidemic that decimated the armies of Virginia. And then more seriously, a smallpox epidemic that completely paralyzed the army of New England at the very time when we had conquered Montreal. So Benedict Arnold had taken Montreal, it was ours. He had to withdraw because he had lost so many troops from smallpox, otherwise, Canada would be part of the United States today if it weren't for that smallpox epidemic. And during, at the end, all the framers knew that when they wrote the Constitution. And between the end of the, of the war and the nine years until we ratified the Constitution, there were epidemics in every city that killed tens of thousands of people, including many of the family members of the people who signed the Constitution, yellow fever, cholera, 
smallpox. And yet they did not put a pandemic exception in the Constitution. They wrote that document for hard times, not for easy times. And I'll just say one other thing, which is during the Civil War, um, Confederates were uh, uh, sending provocateurs into the northern cities to stir up, to incite violence and to stir up uh, draft riots which were very damaging to our national security. And Abraham Lincoln correctly tried to uh, banish the right of habeas corpus and said we can arrest these people on site and imprison them without charges. And the Supreme Court stepped in. Roger Taney was the uh, chief justice of the Supreme Court, stepped in and said, you can't do it. He said, it, it doesn't matter even if, they, and at that time we had lost 659,000 troops is the equivalent of 7.2 million people today, so much worse than COVID. And our country was being, uh, you know, was this far from being torn to pieces. And yet the court said it doesn't matter, even if the country is going to die, you cannot banish the Constitution. And yet they did it. And, you know, to me, um, that was uh, just unacceptable. So, you know, and that's why I ended up in this race. And I told Cheryl, <clears throat> I told her this the other day, there's two times in my view that God has blinded her. And one of them was <laughs> when, I, when I asked her to marry me and she said yes, which was insane at the time. As I was really kind of a mess at that time. And then the second was when I, uh, I said, Pat, what do you think about me running for president? She said, go get him. <laughs> After a brief conversation. Is that <laughs> so, oh my gosh, there's so, I mean, he's so brilliant. You could just sit and listen for hours and learn actual, everything you need to know about history. You know, you say these things and we, we know these things, right? Because we read these facts in books, right? That your father and your uncle were killed. And we, we talk about it like, it's like, oh, you know, there's sushi over there. Yeah, of course. We, like, you were a child who lost your two greatest role models and mentors. And there's a, I don't know why I'm going to quote Nora Ephron, but I'm going to. Please. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a scene in Sleepless in Seattle where he's on the phone and, uh, she says, so what are you going to do? And he goes, well, I'm going to breathe in and out every day. That's what I'm going to try to do first. And I literally sit here and I'm like, you were a 14-year-old kid whose father was murdered, a 10-year-old kid whose uncle was murdered, and then you were able to breathe in and out, learn how to go to Harvard, take a hot girl on a date, <laughs> and then run for president of the United States. Can we just give it up for some courage? I mean, you real. You real. Like, you real. Is there anybody in my lifetime, right? I was born in 79. Don't tell anyone. But no, I mean, is there anyone in your lifetime, if you're my age around that, who you've ever seen run for president who's actually a person of courage like this? Like, what you've lived through. And so I'm curious for you, like, how did those two very seminal events make you the person that you are today? You know, I, it was it was more, I, I would say my father's life had more impact on me than his death and the way that he lived his life. Um, and my uncle as well. Uh, I mean, they, you know, they, I was, you know, I, I feel like very fortunate. You know, I think a lot, and my mom has always said, uh, if, any, if she hears anybody kind of feeling sorry for themselves, she says, everybody takes their licks, you know, and you guys were lucky, and we, which we were. Because we had, you know, there's a lot of kids in, in Watts and Harlem or, you know, in, in Appalachia who lose a dad, and they don't have what we had, which was this huge family that was very, very supportive and, you know, a deep, um, I'd say, religious and spiritual background that was part of our, you know, the gestalt in our in our home growing up, uh, a loving family, and and then kind of a legacy that made sense out of, um, you know, the chaos that brought some order to the chaos and some direction to us, and then you know the resources that we could go get educations and. 
without a lot of struggle, Cheryl. I probably shouldn't tell this, but... But then don't. She can't. <laughs> she, she can't say very, you know, God. what's it, modest means. And yes, she slept in a, the same bed with her mother <laughs> until she left high school. And, um, <laughs> and and put herself through uh, college working as a waitress and a bartender. And, uh, you know, I didn't have to do that. I had resources where I could do that, and I could get into almost any place that I wanted to. And then I had a lot of uh, people around me who supported me. So I feel like, you know, my life was, was fortunate. I think, you know, one of the... My dad, about two weeks before he died, he gave me a book, and it was a book by Camus, and it was called The Plague. And... It was about a, uh, a a city in North Africa that's unnamed that is being ravaged by an unnamed illness that they don't know that they don't understand. It's about a doctor and how he relates to it, and he is uh, he's torn because they don't know how to treat it and they know that it's contagious. So that if you have contact with somebody who has it, you're highly likely to die. Very very high infection fatality rate, and that the only way to stay safe is to stay locked up. And he, um, he spends a, a lot, about the first half of the book is him having a conversation in his head that, you know, his job and his mission in life is to treat people who are, who are ill. And yet there's nothing he can really do to help anybody. He doesn't know what it is. And, you know, he's very likely to die if he goes out and does his profession. But he has this debate with himself. And in the end, he goes out and, you know, and he consoles people and that uh, that act that sacrifice that he makes of doing his duty uh, brings order to the chaos of uh, uh, and meaning to this very very chaotic universe and you know he said my father when he handed me this book he gave it to me with this particular intensity because a lot of times he'd give me books to read but he gave me this and he said I want you to read this and he said it very very directly so um, in the years after he died, I read that book two or three times trying to decipher exactly what it was that he gave me. And what he, um, what I, you know, what I feel like I know what that is now. And Camus was an existentialist and he was kind of a legatee of the Stoics, which were, you know, the, the Greek and to some extent Roman um, ideology. And the, the big hero of the Stoics was Sisyphus. And Sisyphus did an act that caused him to be cursed by the gods to push a stone up the hill for all of eternity. And he would get it to the top of the hill, and, but he'd never be able to get it over. And it would always roll back on him. And then he'd have to walk down and oftentimes injured, etc., and do it again. But in the minds of the Stoic, um, Sisyphus was a happy man because <laughs> he put his shoulder to the wheel. He knew what his duty was, and he did it. And that is kind of how we contribute to the order of the universe. And, you know, a lot of people have said to me, um, you know, that because I, I had a, from taking positions that I did on the, on the medical freedom issues, um, that I've suffered a lot, the loss of a lot of friendships, of family members, of income, of status, of my capacity to, you know, these political relationships that I, I had easily made over all of my life, and I've lost almost all of them, hmm. and all of these things. And um, that people say, oh, that's, you know, that, that, that's very hard on you. And I'm, I feel like, no, that's not hard on me. It's a privilege to have something that, you know, a duty that I'm supposed to do. And um, I, what I try to do the way that I try to live my life is to have no, I never make predictions, and I try to have no expectations. Because if you don't have expectations, you never get disappointed. And the only thing that I have control over is my own conduct, is this little piece of real estate inside my own shoes, and, you know, I have to get up every morning and say, reporting for duty, sir, and then go out and, you know, push the rock up the hill. And whether I get it over there or not is irrelevant. You know, whether I win the presidency or not is ultimately irrelevant. It's not, I, I only have control over what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the outcomes are all in God's hands. And I have to have faith in that. And, but, you know, I can... 
I can feel peaceful and content within myself, which is ultimately the objective, as long as I continue to be of service and just keep doing the next right thing. And that's, you know, so I would say that was kind of, if you ask me the legacy that my dad, I'd I'd say that was one of the important lessons. Don't you feel so honored that you're sitting here getting to hear that? Best place to be in the world right now. Um, I, I'll just tell you one other thing that, <laughs> about that. That, um, that that you know, if you live your life in that way, it gives you a resilience. It gives me a resilience. I feel because I I was you know for the third for almost forty years, I did environmental um, advocacy, and if you're an environmentalist. Every victory that you get is temporary, and every loss that you suffer is permanent. You lose a species, you're never going to get it. God's not making another one if we can't make it. And if you lose a sacred place, it's usually gone forever. There's no way to restore it. And so a lot of my colleagues, including my principal mentor, um, ended up just getting crushed and burning out. And, and withdrawing from everything because they could not, you know, those disappointments were so soul crushing for them. And I saw that happen and I just made a decision. I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm just going to focus on what I do. And then God, you know, has the outcomes in his hands or her hands. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, that gives me a kind of resilience because I I feel like um, I can never be uh, I can never be defeated because every time I get knocked down, I'm just going to stand up again because it's irrelevant to me. And that has made me relentless. And I think that's what. It's unbelievable. We, we went and we were watching uh, this movie, Air. I'm, why am I just quoting movies all the time? Um, it's good. It's a good movie. Anyway, so uh, we were talking about Michael Jordan and like, what is it with Michael Jordan is that when kids would buy these shoes, it wasn't it wasn't about basketball. It was that they want to be like this human being. They want to be like him. And of all the people who are on the earth today. Like, I want to be just like you. I told you when you came to my house, and of course he wants to play 20 questions with my kids, because that's what we're doing. And you wouldn't stop, by the way. I was like, all right, let's wrap. You're like, no, we're doing it again, another round. Um, he's, no, he's the cutest. He loves kids so much. He's like, you want to see my, I pick up rattlesnakes with my own hands. You want to see, my yeah. kids love him. But I want, I told you I want to be just like you because we live in a time where people will choose to belong over being authentic. And you will choose to be authentic. And then that's the only way you'll even know if you belong. Because if you're not authentic, then you don't even belong to yourself. So then if somebody thinks that they belong to you, but you're not telling the truth, nobody belongs to anyone. And you are like the person who I think, probably I'm going to go out on a limb and say one of the main reasons that you're all sitting in this room is because there's an amount of courage in that that you just have never seen, especially in this time where somebody can just be who they are and say what they need to say on behalf of people who are afraid to say anything. Um, And you've talked a lot about your faith. You've said it now like several times. And um, I grew up with really no connection to my faith until I went to Jerusalem after college. I thought I was going to be there for three months. I stayed for three years. It was like hitting control, alt, delete on the software program. And I, I feel like you, I just let go and like connected to something much bigger than myself. Like I can't, Kathy Heller can't have this conversation with you, but my soul can have this conversation with you because you're so loving, you make it so easy. So like this little ego of mine, like she's, forget it. She's on the floor over there. She can't have this conversation. (laughs) But the point is you have this amazing sense of faith and I know how important that is to you. Tell everybody where that comes from and what you learned in your home about God and about faith that maybe we could borrow. Well, first, I'll, I'll, I, I will say this, that the one thing, I mean, I'm really like, I, you know, I feel like what other people um, think of me is, you know, or say about me is not my business, that, you know, that's just part of the noise that, you know, is, is it, but I, there's one person that I do, I, I'm 
you know, completely dependent on, which is this one here. Um, at, uh, you know, and I, it's a big burden on her because I, I've said to her, uh, you're the only one that can actually, you know, change the way that I feel about life because um, her love is so important to me. So, um, you know, I, I'm not completely independent, um, but I, for the most part, I learned that, you know, part of it I learned from my family and part of it I just learned from life, you know, from um, recovery from addiction and, you know, uh, and just all of the little things that we learn in living that, you know, it, does, it really, you cannot worry what other people think about you. And actually, um, yeah, you just can't worry about it. It's not, it's irrelevant. It's not, you know, it just causes drama and it causes a loss of energy and it's irrelevant. And I think that's what you and Larry David have in common. <laughs> <laughs> They'll do and say anything and who cares what people say about her. That's what it is. That's a, she has a type. She true. has a type. I have a type. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl, what about for you? Like when he, I mean, obviously you've heard him say all these things a zillion times. I know how it is as a wife. You're like, you're telling that story again. <laughs> Down. Um, what do you feel? What do you feel the American people could use a little bit more of right now? Uh, I think a lot of people feel forgotten. Yeah. A lot of people feel like they've been left behind. And several years ago, it people were encouraged to hate each other. Yeah. And it's lingering. It really put us in a in a state where people turned on each other and stopped looking at what they have in common and started looking at how someone's different from them and decided that they were going to hate them for it. Yeah. So I I feel like we need somebody to say, let's stop the hate. Let's find out what we have in common and work together in a positive force because it's been missing. It's still missing. And, I, that, and actually, that's why I feel like Bobby, why he should be running for president, because he can do that. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, I, I told this story when I am I. Um, when I was at my announcement, is that something that happened to me when I was, uh, after my dad died, you know, he was killed here in, in LA and I was with him when he died. And then we brought him across the country in uh, Air Force Two. Uh, we brought his body back and, and, um, and waked him at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And then we took him on a train ride from, uh, from Penn Station in New York to Union Station in Washington, D.C., and it's usually a two and a half hour ride. But it was seven and a half hours because there were more than two million people on the train tracks. And that crowd of people, I was 14 years old and I was standing a lot of time between the cars, but also, um, you know, in the caboose with my dad um, where uh, his, his uh, casket was laid out. And it was laid out high enough that people could see it, so that people could see it from the tracks. But it was the it was just this, this incredible cross section of the American public. There was, um, you know, there were uh, in all the big train stations in their urban areas like Trenton, um, Newark, uh, Baltimore, uh, and Wilmington. There were these large, huge crowds just jammed with uh, with black faces singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and we would go through those stations in a crawl. And then along the tracks, there were you know white people, a lot of them in military uniform, hippies in tie dye t shirts. Um, there I remember a Boy Scout troop standing on the side saluting. I I saw a, a, a baseball game, a little league game where um, all the players on, on both sides were standing with their, you know, their hands, their hearts, and the coaches and all the crowd. Um, there was a, when we were in Delaware, there was a, there were seven nuns sitting, six or seven nuns uh, standing in the back of a yellow pickup truck, and they were all waving rosaries or uh, handkerchiefs. 
And there were a lot of mothers, there were rabbis and priests, and everything. there were mothers uh, and people holding up uh, signs that said, goodbye, Bobby, um, uh, flags, and, uh, and signs that say, pray for us, Bobby. And when we got to Washington, uh, one, um, President Johnson met us at the train station, and we drove my father's casket up to uh, Arlington, um, and we drove past the mall, and on the mall there were probably about six or eight thousand men in camps, and it was the Poor People's Campaign, which my father had suggested to Martin Luther King, and then I helped him organize because both of them were worried that the war in Vietnam had bankrupted the war on poverty, and that, and my father said to King, "Poor people are not going to get." Uh, their share of what's happening in this country unless they get politically active and let's bring them all to Washington and uh, keep them camped outside of Congress till Congress does something. And so you had all these men who were camped in these um, plastic, uh, you know, plastic paper shacks um, and they all came to the sidewalk and they stood with their hands at their hearts, they're holding their hats and their heads bowed as we drove past them up the hill to Arlington to bury my father next to his brother. And um, and I remember four years later, this was a cross section of the American public that I saw on every campaign that I had participated in since I was a little boy, which was many. And four years later, I was at college in Boston and I was studying politics, American politics, and I, I saw this demographic data that showed and most of those white people who had stood on the tracks in Baltimore, or south of Baltimore, north of north of Baltimore and south of Baltimore, um, in the and who had su supported my father during the primaries, in 1972, the overwhelming majority of them had had supported not George McGovern, who was completely aligned with my dad, but George Wallace, who was antithetical to my father, you know, a really vicious segregationist uh, and a hate-filled person who I ended up, you know, in, in his old age kind of uh, befriending. And I, I lived two years in Alabama, but at that time he was a very hateful person. And all of these white people who had supported my dad four years later were supporting him. And it, it struck me at that time, and it's occurred to me many, many times since, that every, uh, Every nation, like every individual, has a darker side and a lighter side, and that the easiest thing for a political leader to do is to appeal to our anger, our bigotry, our fear, our greed, our misogyny, xenophobia, and press all of the, you know, or the stir up all the alchemies of demagoguery. And that it's much more difficult to do what my father was trying to do, which was to try to um, get us to. Uh, transcend our narrow self-interest and see ourselves as part of a community, a community that we would really take risks for, you know, personal risks to do something for everybody else. And you have to be of a certain mindset to do that. People have to be convinced that, you know, you're, you, he was trying to convince people that they were on a part of a noble adventure, you know, and that and to, to find the heroes inside of themselves. And to take uh, and to see themselves as Americans rather than you know Republicans or Democrats or whatever, and he succeeded in doing that. He succeeded, I think, mainly just by telling people the truth, ruthlessly telling them the truth. He succeeded in the last day of his life. He won the most urban state in this country, California, and the most rural state, South Dakota, and. Um, you know, and those people who voted later for Wallace are testimony to the fact that you can take people who are filled with hate and you can give them a different vision and inspire them to, you know, to work on behalf of, of communities and uh, to to ignore the seduction of the notion that we can advance ourselves as a people only by leaving our poor brothers and sisters behind, mm -hmm. that we have to look at ourselves as part of a, a community. I mean, I think what you just said is probably the most powerful thing. In about a couple of minutes, we're going to open it up for questions. But I just want to say that, as I said earlier, words, words don't teach. Experience teaches. It's the way somebody sits with you when you're going through a really hard night 
It's the way somebody's there to celebrate with you because they know how hard you work. It's the it's the feeling, and you it's your resonance. That's your legacy. It's not your it's not how beautiful the words are. It's how embodying of those words you are, and no one can stand where you stand and say those words. And that is the medicine that the American people need right now. Is that that love? Yeah, you're the best. And um, I, I think. What's really beautiful about all of you sitting here is that, as he was saying, like if you take something and put it in the sun, it has an equal shadow, right? And everybody who's in this room has a capacity to open their heart and bet on the oneness of this country. That's what you're doing by sitting in this room. That's what you voted for tonight. You voted for us being one. My rabbi in Jerusalem, David Aaron, he says, you're only someone because you're some of the one. There's just oneness. That's it. There is no two sides. There's one side. It's called the human race. It's one side. It's called love. It's called we got to do this together. And there is no single family in the history of America that has loved this country together and loved this country more into life than you and your family. And it is a gorgeous honor to be in this room with you. So... Um, So I was saying to Laura, who's awesome, who helped me put this together, there she is, works on the campaign. I said, I wonder if this country is willing to be courageous enough to merit this kind of leadership. And I think that we can. I think that quite often people patronize people. And they speak to their ego, but their soul is always right there. And their soul wants to connect and it wants to see further. And I think, as I said earlier, what great leaders do is they don't look with their eyes, they look with their heart. And from their heart, they see for miles. And there's no greater person in this world right in this moment who is sitting on the laps of giants who showed this country the furthest we've ever seen. Is it true or is it not? The truth. Yeah, what your family has done for civil rights, we need to get that back. What do you think? Yeah. I agree. <laughs> and by the way, I just want to say, in case anybody sneaks out before you leave, that if you go to kennedy24.com, you can make a donation to this campaign. And I really hope that you will. I really hope that you will. And more than making a donation, because the truth is, you know, there's not like that much you can donate on that website. But if you want to like get involved in bigger donations, you can talk to me. I can tell you how to do that. But more than making a donation is opening your heart and sharing this because the world likes to smear people and just call people names like, oh, he's an anti vax like as if that's the totality of who he is or anything about what he has to say because let's face it, without the Joker, Batman's not Batman and he's Batman. Yeah. He's Batman. And, uh, and the whole world right now is the Joker. And so if you feel like you not like you, you have to like trust me, me or, or some, but if you really felt it tonight, like you feel something in your soul, just tell you like you got the download, share that with five people, right? And if you want to host an event like this or something like that, let me know because you guys, we're, we're, we're moving into the White House, you guys. That's okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and how funny if Larry David winds up being responsible for you winding up in the White House. <laughs> it is a curb episode. It's like it is the a best curb episode. episode ever. Yeah. I also just want to remind you that, you know, there's something in the Talmud that says that before you're even born, it's predetermined like what events you're going to be at, like what weddings you'll be at, what sweet 16s you'll be at. It was like... It was a deal made in heaven that you would particularly be sitting in this room. Mm. And so you really matter and it really counts that you were here and you braved LA traffic and all the things you had to do. Um, I don't know exactly when Bobby's gonna leave, but I mean, take selfies, be, be here, be here, be present. You were here, you were here tonight. Um, and I just wanna say, you know, Cheryl had foot surgery like 10 minutes ago and she's here. Woo! <laughs> um, and 
Would you like to say something? Can we also ask they please include hashtag Kennedy24? Hashtag Kennedy24. Um, and I just want to say, uh, I feel like I'm 43 years old, and if my parent, my grandparents, if they were ever proud of me, I feel like tonight is the night that they're. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Kathy, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much.